await the gonna wait the traditional three minutes or so. I was, I lost track of where I am on the screen. Okay. Um, okay, so I think we're going to get started. Um, so thank you, thank, uh, thank you all, uh, PQI uh, crowd, for joining this afternoon and instead of the 60 degree weather. I'm really delighted to see so many people showing up for this public, public lecture. Um, so let me introduce our speaker today. We're very pleased to have Professor Prineha Narong, who is currently a faculty at the John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University. So prior to that, Pri spent a couple of years at Harvard as a Ziff Fellow and also a research scholar in the Condensed Matter Theory Group at, uh, at MIT. Um, she got her master's and PhD uh, in applied physics at Caltech. Um, so uh, Professor Narang's work has been uh, recognized by many awards and uh, designations, including uh, the National Science Foundation Career Award, the Moore Inventor Fellowship, Max Planck Sabbatical Award, IBM Q Scholar Award, DOE Insight Award, MIT Rising Star in Physics, DARPA Rising Star, uh, the CIFAR Israeli Global Scholar from the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Um, she is a top innovator uh, by the MIT Tech Review uh, Young Scientist Award uh, in the World Economic Forum in 2018. Um, in 2017, she was uh, uh, one listed as uh, one of the 30 under 30 uh, for her work in quantum science and engineering. Um, I, I should also note that uh, she can probably outrun, outbike, outswim everyone on the call. Well, at least one person on the call. But uh, so she is a triathlete. Um, so we're really delighted that she's here today. Um, and the title of her lecture is Controlling uh, Correlations, Not Linear, Nonlinear, and Hydrodynamics in Quantum Matter. So take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for the introduction, for having me here, and again, uh, for spending time with me when you could be uh, getting some photons outside. So hopefully I can get you excited about controlling correlations and, and the, the story of our work going from talking about the linear, the nonlinear, and, and uh, more recently, the hydrodynamical interactions in some of these quantum systems. I want to start by acknowledging the talented set of students and postdocs who've worked with me over the past years. None of this work would be possible without the, the time, effort, and the ideas that they've brought to, to many of these projects. 
Similarly, some of the experimental colleagues uh, across the United yeah, States, Europe, uh, elsewhere that have uh, collaborated with me, and hopefully after this talk, I'll, I'll uh, find ways to interact with, with some of the folks who are here today. So we take a broad view of predicting and controlling quantum systems. And one of the motivations for controlling these quantum systems at their individual level, but also how they couple to each other as the environment is to actually build scalable quantum technologies. So you're here for a PQI talk, so I don't hopefully need to convince you that quantum technologies are useful, important, and, and would transform the way we live our lives and, and uh, drink our coffee or, or tea in, in Roger's case. So one of the things that, that is holding us back from building a scalable quantum network that, for example, competes with the way we, we think about the classical internet are our pieces, quantum repeaters. And, and that's an area, it's an easy example of where controlling quantum systems and coupling them in a way that you have the, the requisite coherence times, you're able to maybe even bring the temperature up closer to what I like to think of as, as quantum room temperature, so exiting the Delfridge, would actually be very, very impactful. Towards that, we think about various ways of predicting some of those interactions. We leverage methods from quantum electrodynamics. I'll show you some work we've done in ab initio, really from first principles, thinking about quantum electrodynamical interactions in matter. I'll tell you about how we think about these, um, also from an electronic structure standpoint. So those of you who are coming from a uh, quantum chemistry background will see how some of these methods that, that have been developed in quantum chemistry can percolate into uh, descriptions of quantum systems, descriptions of uh, condensed matter as well. Finally, I'll tell you about some of the work we're doing in, in uh, very scalable algorithms, computational approaches to talk about transport at a very large scale. So when we think about hydrodynamics, for example, it will become apparent why being at the mesoscale is, is still in some ways insufficient as you start to think about the, the phenomena at which, the lens scale at which these phenomena manifest. When I say we do computational physics, computational materials, Always, I get this question. So what's like the method you use? Like, and and the, the hope or expectation perhaps is that there's one acronym or maybe a couple of acronyms I can insert, uh, you know, uh, one ring to, to rule them all. And uh, there isn't a single ring to rule them all or method to rule them all. However, there are techniques, methods that we can take from, from various lens scales and synthesize them in order to actually predict quantum systems better. And when we think about things on the, the left side of this slide, um, you'll, you'll recognize things like orbital densities, thinking about potential energy surfaces. This is something that techniques in quantum chemistry can tell us a lot about, particularly, of course, invoking the, the gold standard. There are a couple of cluster single doubles that tells you a lot about these small confined systems really, really well. And there are things on the right, which we're more used to thinking about from a condensed matter standpoint. Uh, perhaps we'll be talking about phase transitions. We're talking about characterizing phase transitions. We're talking about level diagrams and, and really uh, things that, that could also involve multiple interfaces and, and many lens scales that are embedded in that same system. So like I said, we try and synthesize methods across these uh, different lens scales, perhaps even um, building our, our own techniques that, that then can, can address problems and bridge across this finite extended system divide. Correlations mean many different things to different people. And, and I'll just uh, give you a, a couple of minutes before we dive into to some examples. So we think about these from a diagrammatic standpoint, and that includes approaches that, that are able to treat the electron-electron interaction at various levels of theory. Electron-electron correlations are the more canonical form of correlations and, and of, of ways to, to treat them, um, span things like dynamical mean field theory. Uh, there are approaches that also um, have been developed, um, again, like DMRT and others that are really, really good at treating these correlations, so frequently don't scale quite as, as easily as, as some other techniques. That's not the only type of correlation. We need to think about the interaction with the lattice. And, and when we talk about the interaction with the lattice, we start talking about things like the electron-phonon interaction. The electron-phonon interaction, if you have a text of Zyman or or uh, your, your favorite condensed matter text sitting around Fedorovlechka, you'd see there are a lot of diagrams that go into uh, describing the, the electron-phonon interaction. However, 
most computational techniques treat electron phonon interactions quite simplistically or perhaps at, at leading order. Treating electron phonon interactions beyond leading order is actually critical to capture excited state behavior, behavior that is truly non equilibrium, including things like excitations, optical excitations that might uh, be very, very important to us in various types of quantum materials. And that's somewhere that we're, we're developing methods and, and really taking uh, the, the divide from, from equations and diagrams that existed in Zyman's text to something that we can actually computationally implement. Finally, we want to think about the lattice beyond just uh, the harmonic approximation. I'll show you some examples today from nonlinear non phononics where actually going well past the harmonic approximation, treating those enharmonic uh, interactions as, as your friend can be really, really powerful in realizing highly nonlinear phenomena. I keep talking about the photon. I love the photon. So um, a, a type of, of interaction or correlation that uh, frequently gets um, neglected is, is truly correlated like that interactions where you simultaneously need the, the quantum nature of, of the photon as well as the correlations that exist in matter. This was brought to the fore by some of the, the recent and, and now also some not so recent, very provocative experiments in cavity control of, of matter, cavity control of phase transitions, and cavity control of molecules. So methods from conventional quantum optics, those of you who've taken courses in quantum optics will, will recognize the James Cummings model is, is a workhorse, and it gets you pretty far. Unless, of course, you want to start treating matter as more than a few level system, and you want to really keep those correlations from those nice diagrammatic methods. Methods in electronic structure, um, density functional theory, and things within the, the GW approximation, or even a couple cluster, don't intrinsically have the photon uh, included beyond a classical approximation. However, there have been recent methods that, that have tried to, to go across this uh, QED and electronic structure uh, method. Uh, not, not quite a divide, but, but you know, they're the fundamentally different communities that haven't necessarily always um, worked together to introduce new methods that are in the top right of this quadrant that, that take electronic structure and QED at the same level of, of, of uh, uh, quantization. So towards that, we've uh, also introduced some methods. And, and here, much like electronic structure, you could ask, OK, I have QED plus electronic structure at the Hartree-Fock level. QED plus electronic structure at the level of time dependent density function theory, QED plus electronic structure at the level of couple cluster. And each of those, of course, as you go up the ladder, become computationally more and more complex, but they're necessary and can be used to describe correlations between light and matter. So that's about methods. Let's go from methods to, to really talking about concrete examples where some of these manifest. That brings me to the, the outline of my talk. I'll start by telling you about some of these linear interactions, polaritons. I'll give you a concrete example of phonon polaritons where, where you can realize some very interesting um, types of, of quantum optical interactions in, in condensed matter. I'll go into nonlinear interactions and talk about how you can drive quantum matter and, and get highly nonlinear dynamics to occur, in particular using the lattice. And finally, go into my new favorite obsession, uh, hydrodynamics. All right. So when we think about QED, um, and, and in particular, think about ab initio QED, the physical system resembles something on the left. You have interacting electrons and interacting nuclei. I'm calling them, nu them nuclei because I'm going to explicitly keep nuclear interactions here in, in my, my calculations. Um, those of you who've seen things like electron uh, uh, nuclear methods from, from um, people in, in various uh, areas of quantum chemistry will, will recognize why keeping nuclei is, is so important, uh, in part because it allows you to keep that finite temperature effect all the way uh, through your calculation without artificially including it after the fact. And we know even, even the lowest temperature physics should keep uh, things beyond um, ignoring those nuclear interactions. 
And of course, we have the photon. Now, this one-to-one -one correspondence uh, might be might be um, something that you're thinking, okay, does this always exist, right? Can I always go from a physical system like the one on the left to an effective cone jam system on the right where I can subsume each of those interactions into non-interacting nuclei, non-interacting electrons uh, and, and photons? And yes, you can, as long as, and this is a uh, proverbial Achilles heel of this, as long as you can find that mean field exchange correlation caramel. So now if we're, we're here in the, the non-relativistic non limit, though in, in earlier work, by the way, we have shown that this QED plus electronic structure um, can, can be uh, formally merged even in the relativistic limit. Let's restrict ourselves to, to the non-relativistic limit today. Operating in a dipole approximation, we exploit this one-to-one -one correspondence between the internal variables, the time-dependent electron density, and the mode resolved displacement coordinate to the external variables, which are the time-dependent external potential and the time-dependent current for a given initial state. And by the way, this is um, common across many different techniques where you then invoke a mean field exchange correlation kernel. All right. So when we do that, that still doesn't get me observables, right? So you're thinking, okay, so all of that now, now give me a spectrum, maybe tell me what I'm going to actually measure. Uh, this is where you have a couple of options, right? So you can either uh, think about your, your now when you have, by the way, light and matter, same level of quantization, you're really talking about polaritonic states where you can't separate those two anymore. And you're trying now to calculate the polaritonic excited state manifold of, of a, a combined system. I refer to it as a manifold in part because there's a, a tendency to think I have the ground state, maybe the first or a second excited state, and I'm, I'm in good shape. But actually, some of these interactions have, and, and interactions of cavity in particular, change the avoided crossings and the behavior all the way up to very, very um, highly excited states. And that's actually something that our method is able to explicitly treat. Now, we go in the, the regime of, of uh, linear response. It'll become apparent here in a second why uh, linear response is, is okay. Though, of course, if you're thinking of, of being in a regime where you're uh, invoking very, very highly uh, high numbers of photons, then, then linear response would not be so good. But most of these experiments are in a regime where linear response can be justified. And we pick between either being in a time domain where you explicitly time evolve or formulating a, a pseudo eigenvalue problem. And, and that's in the frequency domain that'll allow us to avoid the, the issues associated with explicit time propagation for, for a certain number of say, um, hundreds of femtoseconds or, or picoseconds. There are other types of methods that could be relevant here. And that includes, of course, an exact factorization approach, uh, perhaps a, a conditional decomposition approach. Um, I, I mentioned this idea of QED plus hartree fock You could also think about Maxwell plus hartree fock wave function approaches. Um, and those have all been in various forms tried on this problem and have their own limitations that our approaches are able to overcome. We explicitly have looked at regimes of vibrational strong coupling where, where you, you really um, need to keep all of those ingredients and, and talk about um, response functions that include both the uh, interactions with the, with the interactions and correlations of matter, as well as the interaction with the light. So now you'll see that I have two different uh, kernels that need to be uh, approximated. So I can, I can formally divide the exchange correlation kernel into a part that describes the electron-electron interaction. I can pick here the, the uh, Hartree exchange correlation functional, and of course, the part that incorporates all the effects due to the electron-photon interaction, okay? So now, a lot of the development work here is really around finding good exchange correlation kernels that can be generalized to various types of systems. And, and here, we've made some strides towards this, in particular, in thinking about the excited state manifolds of, of these um, larger, more, more complex molecular systems, where we can calculate states that are a mixture of Rydberg states, as well as more localized valence states, such as the pi and, and pi star states. Um, you, if, you might be thinking, uh, uh, molecule, aha, okay, um, how, do I, how do I think about um, vibrational strong coupling there? But actually, in, in some of those cases, you could really modify the, the pathway that the, the energy pathways that are associated with that system uh, by, by coupling to the cavity. And this has some nice intersections with the work that was done previously by Shaw Mukamel and others in manipulating non adiabatic dynamics and avoided crossings and um, you know, things of, of that sort. 
So this is a blend of, of DVD uh, and, and quantum chemistry and, and really using tools from quantum optics to change things about both molecules and matter. So all of these things, right? I, I, you could do, you could think about a 2D material, you could think about a giant molecule, you think about a 2D material sitting in a cavity and all of the, the techniques that we are developing are applicable to both of those systems. Finally, a question we kept getting asked is what happens when you have loss? How do things change? We have a good handle on that. We have an understanding of what happens when you have uh, dissipation explicitly included. And, and we, can, we can tell you where it, the, the strong coupling is turned back by um, some of these um, lossy and, and dissipative interactions. So, okay. Always need an exchange correlation curve. Well, not quite. You could change that by going to these photonic quasi particles. And, and one of my students said, you know, this exchange correlation kernel development, not for me, but, but I really want to think about this totally differently. And uh, so that's, that's what we did. We introduced a method for non perturbative interactions where you in, take a system on the left with you know, a bunch of excitations of the bare uh, material, molecule, atom, and, and the cavity photons, you approximate it with a few virtual excitations. And those few virtual excitations, now you get a very non perturbative ground state that you can then, um, and this is a real space method, variational QED, where you can then see exactly how the system is behaving. Okay, and so now we have three things we can compare. We can compare our method, the variational QED method, which is in blue, uh, exact numerical diagonalization. Uh, by the way, this method scales very, very well. Uh, we, we, the, the limiting factor in creating this, this plot and why we stuck to some of these smaller systems is because we wanted to contrast this with exact diagonalization, which is uh, computationally uh, very, very uh, expensive. And we compare that with a perturbative approach. What you find is that in, in regimes of, of no coupling or moderate coupling, everything is good. The, the variational, the numerical, and the perturbative approaches all uh, are, are in agreement. You get into regimes of, of uh, some strong coupling, and, and suddenly you start to see oops, the perturbative regime, uh, the perturbative approaches are going uh, kind of in the wrong direction, not just a, a little bit in the wrong direction. Uh, this is what I would lovingly call a major discrepancy between uh, what is expected from exact diagonalization and what our method predicts, which by the way, agree across that regime. Okay, so now this is going from no coupling to, I mean, this regime you would never be able to realize in of, of deep ultra strong coupling. You, wouldn't really realize this using optical or terahertz cavities. This is something you could realize in, in superconducting cavities, however. And we find that our method, unlike most others out there, is able to span that entire regime of, of coupling. So and this is a method that is very low computational cost. So unlike something that you need to run on a large cluster, this is something that you could run on your laptop during COVID times and, and do your own non perturbative QED at home and come up with all different kinds of, of observables. We've come up with some new observables from this real space method, including descriptions of uh, spatial dependence of Kazmier Polder in the non perturbative regime, which we think that people doing these uh, measurements of, of rare earths very close to surfaces where they're looking at forbidden transitions could actually measure. So controlling light at the, the atomic scale, uh, you know, you, you think about these molecules and cavities, materials and cavities, and you think, okay, well, that's great. Um, that's maybe changing some property of, of the, the, the quantum system in there. But actually there are other reasons that you could, you could use strong coupling and polaritonic physics to control other, um, other interactions using the polariton, okay? And, and here's what I mean by that. You can get really extreme confinement of electromagnetic energy by exciting uh, certain types of polaritons. This is the trick that people played quite successfully in, in plasmonics for some time. You can also do something very similar with excitons in, in 2D materials. Uh, there's a whole polariton panorama in magnons and it keep, keeps going, right? But you can specifically think about these phonon polaritons that really hold promise of strong and a totally new uh, forms of control over the dynamics of matter. And, and the reason they are able to surpass things like plasmons are because they exist uh, primarily in the near mid IR where you see this uh, splitting, uh, the, the LOTO split in the, the Rastralin band of these polar materials where um, 
the loss is really not as big a factor as say plasmonics or other dielectrics in the visible and, and in the near IR, okay? So we wanted to ask, okay, good. So I have light, I can confine it to a single atomic layer. Um, I, can, I can bring an emitter close to it and, and maybe I'm gonna see uh, some, some really interesting forms of, of strong coupling appear. The first question that came up is, well, if you have a true monolayer at the gamma point, right? My, my favorite condensed matter textbook would tell me there should be no LOTO split in a true 2D material. In, in a bulk or a few layers, that would be the case, but in true 2D material, that should not be the case, even for polar materials. So we wanted to ask ourselves, well, does this lack of LOTO split imply the absence of a phonon polariton in polar monolayers, or is there another way that we can think about addressed phonon in, in these systems where, where you still have a polariton without having that LOTO split with the, the lower and the upper polariton? Towards that, we derived a first principles expression for the connectivity of a polar monolayer that's specified by the, the wave vector dependent LONTO uh, phonon dispersion. So then we take a uh, long wavelength, which is a local limit, to, to get a form of the connectivity um, that, that and, and, and I say universal here because we didn't actually specify this for a particular material, which was good because we first then use that for known materials and then decided to go out there and find other systems where people haven't observed phonon polaritons to say what those phonon polaritons would look like. So this is what, and, and I have very few slides with equations on them, so please stay with me. I know this is a public lecture, so I'll try and walk us through uh, the, the uh, equation heavy slides, let's say. So we developed a theory of the electromagnetic response due to these um, optical phonons in, in 2D uh, materials. And the, the key response um, here is now uh, talking about the connectivity of this layer. Um, connectivity, by the way, is better for monolayers than thinking about epsilon for a whole host of reasons. And one of them being that you're not artificially confining uh, the response to, to uh, essentially uh, a single sheet of the material. So we, we found a way to then re-express this connectivity in terms of the, the dispersion with a form in the local limit that essentially depends on the LO uh, phonon frequency at the gamma point and the group velocity of the LO phonon at the gamma point and the damping rate. And this actually allowed us to reconcile this debate, this question people had in the field, if you could truly have a phonon polariton in 2D materials. Claim like that needs to be backed by experiment. And so after a prediction, uh, together with Dmitry Basov, this was experimentally observed, um, order matters. We found a way to, to look at properties of phonon polaritons in a, a true monolayer of fixed acrid boron nitride that was then compared with a bulk. So uh, the top left here is looking at the real imaginary parts of the connectivity for, for different values of that loss rate. Again, emphasizing further why this is a good way to go about achieving strong coupling. And what you see is that the, the, the monolayer actually, it, in which it stands out here for, for various reasons, uh, its dispersion is different from even a few layers, or if you try and restrict uh, and, and reduce the thickness down to um, a, a layer without necessarily going to this other form. So we think there's fundamentally uh, new stuff that you can do with these phonon polaritons, including going into regimes of ultra strong coupling by, by looking at, and, and we were then able to say, okay, let's get ambitious. Maybe instead of a full sheet, you can make little disks and, and think about interaction with external emitters could be um, could be a rare earth, could be your, your favorite quantum data mirror, and, and say, you know, you can use this extreme enhancement of spontaneous emission with, because of this coupling with a very localized 2D phonon polariton and, and use that to get multi-mode strong and ultra strong coupling between this emitter and, and this phonon. And that's a different regime of quantum optics that people have uh, previously explored, leading to, to the design, hopefully, of new hybrid states of, of electrons and phonons based on this strong coupling. Okay. So that was all for, for predictions of, of what you can do in HBN. Then you'd say HBN, silicon carbide are kind of old materials. They still keep coming back, but um, Pri, why don't you tell us about something that hasn't been uh, found to have phonon polaritons yet. All right, so we looked at oxide perovskites. Now, oxide perovskites, strontium titanate, others, uh, long, very, very rich history, all the types of physics that I know of can in some regime be accomplished in strontium titanate, which, I, which has always amazed me. But 
one thing that, that happened in, in 2019 was the, the group of uh, Paul Tuong was able to synthesize a monolayer of structure tightening. And that was exciting because then we started to ask, it has a strong IR active phonon mode. Uh, there are many interesting things about the phonon modes in Strashup Titanic, including one that couples out a plane to, to potentially uh, concussionize superconductors and, and magically boost their TC, for example. We said, let's just try and understand if this thing has a phonon plariton, because if it has a phonon plariton, and I can talk about squeezing that phonon plariton, uh, I should be able to have a handle on that. Uh, coupling between structure tightening and, and these other types of calcogenide model layers. So um, in doing that, what we realized is that structure tightening is not the only one. There are actually a whole host of other uh, similar ABO3 perovskites that in their model layer exist and can not only be as good as, but in some cases better than hexagonal boron nitride in the, the types of phonon platons you can excite. And now this is taking phonon platons into a part of the terahertz that you couldn't take HBN or, or silicon carbide. So bringing this um, idea of ultra strong confinement into uh, the, the terahertz. So, so we are now looking for ways that these uh, can be experimentally measured. So if you feel like you wanna uh, go out there and, and make a model layer of these, I, I, uh, I'm strong. thermodynamics is on your side. And actually, and what I'm not showing on this slide is that it doesn't just have to be these, these three, uh, another very prominent and exciting perovskite lithium niobate could also exist in a monolayer, monolayer sorry, and show some of these interesting phonon platons. Uh, lithium niobate, for those of you who think about nonlinear optics, know that it's uh, uh, the uh, best nonlinear material that people are, are using in various uh, quantum architectures, frequency conversion, transduction schemes. Um, and if you could actually, uh, again, find another way to control the behavior of lithium niobate, that could be very cool. So we have predictions for that. This paper has, I've been saying this for a couple of weeks now on the archive this week, but um, I think this week it actually happens. All right. So let me um, switch gears from, from um, polaritons and, and things in that linear response, linear regime, where we're really talking about a single photon uh, talking to, to a, a matter excitation to get into nonlinearities. The first form of nonlinearity I'm going to talk about, you might not easily think of as, as a nonlinearity. This is a single atom nonlinearity with a quantum defect in, in quantum matter. And how actually one of those defects or any of those defects that are uh, optically active and simultaneously spin active can do all of the things that we're uh, used to seeing in, in uh, AMO physics. The second not type of nonlinear interaction when I talk about driven interactions will, will be a little more of, of the, the familiar uh, territory. Okay. So defects in matter can actually enable uh, quantum nonlinear optics. So the same way that atoms and, and ions are, are able to, to do that, uh, we're used to thinking of ion traps. There are companies around using uh, these trapped ions as, as quantum systems now, both uh, as, as uh, quantum computers and also as now more recently as quantum repeaters. Or you think about these uh, atoms that are confined in a, in a, a very well-defined potential of some sort. Those are both examples of the types of, of things you can do in, in conventional AMO physics. The promise of condensed matter is that you can have all of that now realized with defects in solids. So it essentially is an artificial atom that is trapped in a solid and it's giving you additional it's, it's as isolated in some cases, so uh, we, can, we can discuss how isolated or not it is, and it can give you access to more couplings, more, more control knobs that you wouldn't necessarily have in AMO physics. And of course, the final promise of this, particularly towards making scalable quantum memories that go into a repeater or into a QRAM architecture, is that uh, you, can, you can exit the, the Delfridge. And this is where, if you're a material scientist, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Defects, bad, should be avoided. I would like to encourage you to embrace and talk about unlocking the superpower of these quantum defects. No, not all defects are quantum defects, but the ones that are can actually do some pretty amazing stuff. The most canonical biggest example is, is the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. Um, that is the one system that I am not going to talk about here today. And, and that's because a lot has been said and written about it. And, and well, beyond just saying it needs to be surpassed, it has good spin properties. It has very, very uh, deficient optical properties. It's sensitive to, to 
surfaces, charge noise, et cetera, and their things, well, the periodic table gives us many opportunities to do better than the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. So that's what we do, okay? So now we're gonna talk about the group four defects in diamond, particularly an interesting type of physics that emerges there, uh, the Jan Teller instability, which really turns it into a very strongly coupled electron phonon system. And, and I'll, I'll tell you why here in a second that becomes important actually to uh, realizing the technological promise of these group four defects. So group four, if you don't have a, a periodic table handy, a silicon, germanium, tin, and lead. Um, when implanted into diamond, these, um, naturally thermodynamically adopt a negative charge state. However, with, with some magical co-doping, some, some, some experimental juju, you can get these to adopt a neutral charge state. And there are reasons to do that. The negative charge state, while being easier to, to create, has a couple of downsides. It's been half limited spin coherence. You go to a neutral charge state, suddenly it's been one, good spin coherence, life is good. This is what people showed. Um, Natalie de Leon and, and many others for uh, the silicon vacancy neutral with uh, really, really impressive properties. The problem with the silicon vacancy neutral is well, it's not enough spin orbit. So the idea was, why don't we go down the periodic table and see if, if some of the heavier group fours could actually also have this, this spin one, long spin coherence, but also give you uh, this larger ground, split, ground state splitting that is uh, associated with the, the spin orbit. Okay, so if you're used to looking at the level structure and you're like, what's, what, what's the level structure like, right? So life is good in the ground state. Uh, situation looks like uh, on, on the left, very symmetric. However, as soon as you optically excite, you create an orbital imbalance. And that orbital imbalance is essentially the source of this uh, Jan Teller instability in the system. Jan Teller instability has been studied quite extensively in oxides, other systems. Uh, this is, this is uh, a slightly different way to think about the answer and, and slightly different reason to think about it. First order, everything looks good, rotationally symmetric minima around some high symmetry point. The second order, you start to see these small barriers and you see three degenerate minima. This would not normally be a, a problem um, unless you realize, of course, those, those small um, energy barriers differences actually are make all the difference between uh, whether you've identified the, the uh, tin negative or the tin neutral. And so a lot of the uncertainty around finding other group four neutrals has been around quantifying and understanding the physics of this uh, potential energy landscape. We go to a second order because it can actually shift those absolute energies and therefore completely change the the spectrum. So if you're trying to do peak assignment uh, without incorporating the, the Jan Teller, you might be off by, by a fair bit, not just a couple of MeV, but by hundreds of MeV. So the Jan Teller is, of course, dynamic. Uh, the the uh, spin orbit uh, is, is changed. Um, the, the electronic operators are, are uh, modified. And this is something that is, again, important for the group four neutrals. So group four neutrals have actually a product of two dynamic Jan Tellers. It is as it sounds. It's a tensor product of two things that are individually complex. And the solutions are constructive and destructive interference with these single Jan Teller surfaces. So now you're, you have a, a fairly interesting potential energy landscape and, and different barriers that, that uh, you could, uh, via some interesting quantum spectroscopy, try and, and nail down. And we make predictions for this um, with, with, and by the way, our, I said to, to spare everyone uh, yet another uh, a derivation of a, a non perturbative description, but this description does uh, go beyond what traditional uh, ground state theories would, um, would do for, for this uh, product and teller. It's something that is, again, inherently excited state physics uh, going to, to higher order in that electron photon coupling. We predict the signatures. What I'm showing on the slide is for the tin vacancy neutral. And there are many efforts underway, both in the US and in Germany, to identify, find, and, and uh, fingerprint this uh, color center. It's believed to, and from our predictions as well, something that would have uh, properties that surpass all the other color centers in diamond. A lot about diamond. Question always comes up in 2D can all of this be done better? Right? 2D materials are, are very nice. Everything's on the surface. Um, so I can think about patterning and, and deterministic placement a lot easier, a lot more easily than I could for, say, a 3D system where everything seems to be implanted somewhat stochastically. So, yes, uh, artificial atoms in, in 2D materials can be optically uh, 
active. They can be interesting single photon emitters. Um, of course, talking about them as optically addressable spin qubits is a little bit fraught at the moment. And here's why. Uh, there are two regimes in which you can see the defects in, in these systems. One is on the left, which is it's a nice defect state, exactly like the physics in, in diamond that I showed you. Uh, you have two levels, you, you excite, you relax, you get a photon out. Good. People have seen this in hexagonal boron nitride, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the mysteries in hexagonal boron nitride here in a second. But you can also have a system that, that is the calcogenides, where, where instead of looking at the defect state, you could be getting emission from a bound exciton. And that's something that people have seen in, in toxocyanide, toxosulfide, some of these other systems. And, and they've tried to use strain to then localize these excitons to then very controllably get um, photons out. The challenge is that in most cases, probably it is a combination of defect states and bound excitons that are being experimentally observed. Um, and, and there's a lot of debate around fingerprinting exactly where the emission is coming from, both in HBN as well as in uh, these calcogenides. Okay. And of course, there's always the environment, there's some long range disorder, you really uh, need to think about how to actually control these. So this is a, an area which is, I think, perfect for uh, connecting theory with, with imaging and, and various types of microscopy, in particular, uh, new advances in electron microscopy that allow you to do things that uh, might be able to address some of those mysteries that I, I, I showed on, on this slide. Okay. And I'll show you Two quick vignettes before I go into to driven interactions and I actually want to have time for hydrodynamics, but the first is on hexagonal boron nitride what, um, in, in work that appeared early last year. We, with a combination of our predictions as well as uh, um, the, the correlated photoluminescence and cathodoluminescence on a stem column, we're able to try and identify the, the um, what is, is the source of defect emission and how much can you attribute to local strain. So here's what I mean by that, right? So there's a zero phone online, there's a phone on sideband. Um, the zero phone online is traditionally very sensitive to, to strain. And you would say that in hexagonal boron nitride, perhaps the reason people see peaks all over the place is because the ZPL is moving around with, with strain. What we were able to show is that strain explains some, but not most of, of uh, the, the mysteries here, at least in uh, many layers of hexagonal boron nitride. So from theory, we we're able to predict the, the ZPL and how it shifts with strain, uniaxial, biaxial, we create these strain plots. And from a combination of STEM, CL, and PL, um, our experimental colleagues were able to, to really identify um, what's, what's, what's going on. Um, not quite, so STEM itself is, is atomic resolution, but CL is, is from a broader space than that. So there's a, a little bit of uh, uh, ambiguity there. However, we were able to eliminate some easy um, hypotheses. So first we realized it's not the native point defects that are responsible. So the nitrogen vacancy here is actually not what is the source of emission. In fact, some of the smaller uh, defects are, are too mobile. So if you, if you uh, uh, do a combination of CL, PL, and you come back, you find the same thing in, um, so PL, CL, and then PL, you find uh, the same defect is probably one of these defect complexes. What we wanted to extract from that was also some design principles around other types of defects you could engineer in hexagonal boron nitride to have favorable properties. So uh, folks in, in um, various types of uh, uh, synthesis of, of these materials based on uh, knowing something about what what space you're, you're trying to, to target, what types of defects can change, say, the, the oxygen getter that, that your HBN is next to, that might allow you to change uh, um, the, the thermodynamics, essentially, of the system biasing it towards certain types of defects. So we wanted to say, which type of defect is desirable based on some uh, design principles such that we can actually engineer these uh, emitters uh, as close to room temperature as possible. I, I think I neglected to mention that HBN is attractive from that standpoint because people have been able to find uh, emission pretty close to uh, room temperature-ish uh, from this system. And, and that's really what got everyone energized. TMDs, whole different story. Okay, so that nice picture I have typically of TMDs with there's a defect and bound exciton and that's all that's happening. Well, that kind of all goes out the window because of the amount of disorder that, that having some defects in TMDs introduce all across the entire sheet. So using uh, a reconstruction, again, STEM, and then 
uh, uh, essentially uh, tilting and, 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 and reconstructing from there, we're able to, to uh, figure out uh, for, for MOS2 and MOSC2 with, with uh, some of these heavier defects, um, what really happens to the sheet. We were very surprised. What we found is that as soon as you have multiple defects, uh, the, the sheet uses this out of plane degree of freedom a lot. It suddenly becomes very easily disordered and, and the you know, PowerPoint picture of, of constraining it to, to a monolayer, or even the, the theory assumptions people make of saying that all of my, uh, um, I, that, that it's, it's not going to use this out of plane degree of freedom actually uh, go, goes out the window. So we, we find actually that you, you have these long range ripples, you, you start to, this sheet essentially starts to crumple in, in some ways in, in um, its, its behavior and suddenly becomes very disordered looking even with a very low density of defects relative to uh, what you'd expect to cause that type of disorder. To the best of my knowledge, this is the first quantitative assessment of that type of, of disorder and its impact on quantum opt electronic properties. We have upcoming work on how uh, interfaces, uh, lateral heterostructures in particular of uh, uh, different types of 2D materials also characterized from this technique uh, can, can show very uh, interesting and unexpected behaviors that might explain uh, some of the, the uh, you know, crazy results people have seen with, with phonon transport across interfaces. So all of that lives at the nanoscale. Right. But my quantum technology, I keep saying, is going to be at the meso macro scale. So I got to make an interface to these nonlinearities. I got to make that interface be really, really efficient. Now I have, uh, you know, like opportunity to to pick. And, and this is where I'd like to advocate for an approach that that is uh, uh, from qubit to to protocol, uh, because picking uh, your, your optically addressable spin qubit and, and finding one that's excellent isn't the same as actually incorporating it in uh, any of those technologies that, that I alluded to in particular, uh, if you're trying to, to uh, use that as a, as a repeater or a memory of some sort. So with the interfaces, you could think about direct dipole mediated interfaces, and that's something that uh, relies very heavily on proximity. You can think about phonon mediated. Now this is where maybe you have a little more leeway with the lens scale. Or you could think about an external excitation like something that is magnon mediated. And those would then allow you to either connect to other, other types of spin qubits or connect to um, uh, superconducting qubits. And, and there are hybrid architectures that people have suggested that use a combination of um, superconducting and uh, uh, color center based uh, systems simultaneously where, where the color center is acting essentially as a nice uh, memory. Let me show you um, what you could do with magnons. Okay, so now uh, magnons, um, okay, magnetic excitations in, in materials um, don't necessarily lend themselves to, um, so you know, you'd say, okay, great, so I can think about magnons and things are, are um, you know, fairly bulk like. Well, there were recent measurements that, that showed that you could have regimes of single magnon, single shot, single magnon um, um, excitation. And, and that paper, I think, uh, appeared either late in, in 2019 or, or early 2020 in, in science that really showed that magnons, single magnons could get into the same regimes of QED that all the other types of uh, uh, work was, uh, was showing and could be used to mediate uh, interactions with spits. So we thought about nanomagnetic cavities where you're essentially using magnon modes of a, a sphere of YIG or pick your favorite ferro ferromagnetic material. And these act as a microwave uh, uh, nanomagnetic cavity that, that concentrates microwave fields uh, into a deeply sub-wavelength volume. And remember uh, here, hundreds of nanometers is fine to go deeply sub-wavelength from, uh, uh, from the microwaves. That's, that's uh, so you know, those of you who are coming from a photonics or plasmonics background might say this doesn't look so deeply sub-wavelength, but actually for microwaves it is. And we find that actually uh, the, the field in, in such um, cavities can very efficiently couple to isolated emitters. We looked at um, nice uh, ways of, of uh, uh, coming up with magnon mediated gates all the way uh, to, to something that might look like a, a magnon mediated uh, um, scheme that can go into a, a quantum network. There are, of course, challenges associated with background mediated interactions, in particular because it means you have to apply magnetic fields, which certain types of superconducting systems don't like. Uh, so so we're, we're trying to work around that and see if you can use other magnetic excitations. I want to um, 
take the, the next few minutes before I, I get to hydrodynamics, and I, I know I'm, I'm running out of, of time um, to, to tell you about how you can really control highly nonlinear excitation. So way back early in this talk, I said something about um, the, the phonons themselves being something that you could uh, control and be away from, from the harmonic uh, approximation. It turns out that when you talk about enharmonic phonon, phonon processes, the, there's, a, there's a lot of option. There are different frequency, different, um, frequency ionic Robin scattering type processes, some frequency uh, processes, and of course you can talk about the parametric uh, um, to uh, third and fourth order processes that you could really tailor, again, using uh, uh, just the, the right um, nonlinear phonetic material. This is an area where um, you could also combine ideas with, with cavity coupling to then um, engineer the types of nonlinear interactions between phonon modes to go from a, a, a certain type of vibrationally uh, highly excited state and, and do some redistribution of the vibrational degrees of freedom uh, using uh, ideas from uh, cavity control. In fact, this blends uh, the fields of nonlinear phenonics and, and uh, cavity control that um, I, I think is, is a very, uh, it's, it's very much a, a growing area. Same types of phonon control uh, can actually be uh, something that, that you uh, realize. So I'll give you one example of this and I, I see that, that either Jeremy or somebody else sent me a note saying to, to uh, start wrapping up. So I'll, I'll, I'll do that here. So if you think about structural distortions in, in uh, say, uh, hexagonal manganites or, or your favorite uh, system that, that has um, a, a structural or a parameter, um, these have essentially Higgs and Goldstone-like phonon modes, okay? And normally you'd say, okay, well, if, if one is, is uh, um, optically silent, then, then you know, I'm, I'm, there's nothing I can do about it. Well, but you know, these, these order parameters, which are essentially the physical observables that can be used to quantify the, the uh, understand the various states here, uh, you could couple into one uh, and you could coherently then think about transferring energy to the other. And in this case, um, the, the Goldstone mode is the one that's silent and the Higgs mode is, is optically active, Higgs-like, Goldstone-like phonon modes. And we, we show that you can coherently transfer energy to the Goldstone mode through a parametric down conversion. So this is an example of the type of nonlinear uh, and, and highly non-equilibrium order parameter physics that becomes possible by using those, uh, those uh, the, the phonon interactions that are, are beyond the, the simple harmonic approximation. We, we show that actually this type of dynamics, um, so you, you see the, the terahertz pulse come in, in green, it excites that blue Higgs mode, and that decays into uh, um, um, a Goldstone mode, a pair of Goldstone modes, and you see that, that redistribution of energy. And we can, we can show and do this type of explicit time propagation using uh, explicit knowledge of the line widths of, of both the, the Higgs and the, the Goldstone mode. You don't have to stop there. You could you could show all kinds of ways that phonons allow you to realize nonlinear um, nonlinear optics. So so you could use optics to excite nonlinear phonetic processes. You could use the phonon coupling to actually show that you can nonlinearly uh, uh, control and even in some cases um, really get very high synthetic uh, magnetic fields, much like what people have done in these uh, optomagnetic effects. So we call this area uh, the, the phonomagnetic analogs to your, your favorite optomagnetic and magneto-optical effects, where we see that actually the, the, all that matters is a giant, okay, really truly giant uh, spin phonon coupling. Uh, nickel oxide gives you some. Um, you can get some, some effective magnetic fields. Effective here is an important uh, uh, consideration because it's not a real field. This is a synthetic field. Uh, you can get to something like a few millitesla, though, of course, um, if you pick just the right system, as we do with uh, these rare earth trihalides, you can get something that is uh, many Teslas of synthetic magnetic fields. So we have predictions for this. Uh, we hope that people will go out there and, and look for these because these actually would allow for, for uh, the bidirectional control of the induced magnetization and, and create a way for, for controlling the magnetic and electrical order, electric order of, of uh, uh, various uh, ferric materials using uh, uh, driven as well as interfacial coupling ideas and and you could get much fancier with this and also uh, introduce uh, 
a superconductor and, and have some of these magnetic systems and, and really start uh, and, and essentially go, go crazy with the, the types of interactions you want. Okay, I may not have time for, for hydrodynamics, but I'll just uh, say that this is something that uh, we've been excited about seeing in, in various topological materials. Uh, everything that you learned in your fluid dynamics class, perhaps in a uh, either uh, a course that, that introduce you to equations of motion like Navier-Stokes or uh, a chemical engineering course actually becomes relevant in describing these. I, I see Susan giving me a thumbs up. Uh, well, you know, I, I never really actually took um, fluid dynamics formally. I, I strategically avoided ever taking fluid dynamics. And then I found myself uh, greatly uh, obsessed with electron hydrodynamics and quickly realized that I needed to, to teach myself something about it. So we've actually been able to do interesting stuff with it. Most uh, recently, I'll, I'll skip over some of this because you're not gonna have time uh, to talk about the viscosity tensor, realizing that a full rank four tensor is actually much more rich than the single viscosity number that people have used in the case of graphene. And actually, if you constrain this viscosity tensor uh, a little bit, um, to something that, that essentially allows you to, to relate the, the fluid stress from uh, rising from some form of gradient, could be electric field gradient with a, a fluid viscosity. You can actually constrain this just by crystal symmetries and, and a few other things and, and realize uh, very interesting terms of the viscosity tensor that don't go away. Uh, that includes uh, vorticity coupling. So, so we have predictions for how time reversal symmetry broken systems that have hydrodynamics uh, uh, could also have these steady state vortices. And of course, there's the Hall viscosity, other types of dissipative terms. Now we're trying to figure out how we can actually uh, use these in, in uh, various uh, uh, contexts. And there are, there are interesting uh, analogies with, with uh, conventional hydrodynamics, but there are also some differences when you, when you uh, think about these electron fluids and we're trying to establish those for systems beyond graphene. Okay, um, so, so here the origin of hydrodynamics is different from graphene. It cannot be parametrized by a single viscosity number. I think people got really lucky there with how isotropic graphene is. We think there's actually a very broad system, set of systems that it will exhibit uh, interesting hydrodynamic signatures. Okay, with that, let me, oh, let me also make the point that phonons have a role here. They're underappreciated. So if we have time during overtime, and I know I'm meeting with some of the graduate students, this is a great topic to ask me about. Um, with that, let me just summarize and say I told you about different types of, of light matter interactions, linear, nonlinear, um, and, and how you can actually think about controlling some of these uh, interactions, both at the single um, atom level uh, with these, these small defects trapped in solids, as well as uh, more, more uh, driven systems, you know, you're hitting it with a, with a giant uh, terahertz pulse. Um, I think there, there's uh, a lot to do here in understanding as well uh, the, the dynamics and hydrodynamics in various quantum uh, materials, topological quantum materials in some cases. And, and I look forward to, to uh, interactions with, with many of you on, on some or all of these topics. When I acknowledge funding, just on the off chance, there are program managers here, um, and particularly from the, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, um, the, the Moore and Vegeta Fellowship actually uh, allowed me to, to free up time from, from activities uh, and, and be um, very, very uh, focused on, on research uh, for, for a, a few years. Uh, and of course, uh, for um, support from the DOE, both financially and in the form of uh, extensive computational time that uh, allows us to do these big systems. Thank you for being here. Uh, thanks again to, to my group and happy to take questions. Oh, thank you. All right. So I'm going to clap for everybody like audibly. So just imagine that multiplied by 170. Um, so uh, I, I, I certainly have questions, but I, I think I would like to prioritize questions from the audience. Um, particularly students. students yes, or particularly students or anybody really. Um, so I think if you um, just unmute yourself, because I can't see there's so many like screens, I can't really tell who's uh, raising. D, I see D has raised his hand. Yeah, so, so uh, hi, um, Priya, thanks for this very nice talk. Um, I, I have two questions about uh, phonon magnetic moments. Uh, the first question is just uh, about uh, some classification. When we talk about a phonon magnetic moment, there are two types. One is you have two degenerate mode, 
And you sort of have this uh, X plus IY type circular motion driven by a circular polarized light. Right. The other one are actually chiral modes where when you move away from gamma point, you could have a photon carry actual moments without yeah. it. So we, we, which one were you talking about? So in, in the results I've shown here, I'm looking at the former, though in some other work, we've also looked at the latter. I see. So, so the other question is that, uh, so could you, could you share a little bit of insight on what are the sort of uh, black magic to get a larger magnetic moment out of photon mode? Because I know typically yeah. it's, it's very tiny. Yeah, so, so here um, we, we really, I think, got um, incredibly lucky. Okay, so we, we show here for, for serum trichloride and then realize this is actually general for various uh, rare earth trihalides that circularly driven photon modes in these can generate giant effective fields because they're acting on the paramagnetic 4F spins. And somebody had, I don't know, in some old table, uh, met, you know, measured the, the spin photon coupling here. Mm -hmm. So that's, that got us thinking that maybe this is general to other paramagnetic uh, 4F systems and, and turns out that is actually the case. So, so you, you, can, you, you, can, you mean the, the, the photon motion actually polarized the spin or? So you have these circularly driven uh, photon modes and, and you're, you're, there's a, a giant spin photon coupling. So you're essentially, uh, you know, uh, the, the way I think about it is you, the, the spin photon coupling is allowing you to go from this driven phonon directly to, to the spins. I see. All right. Thanks. And, um, this is something that, you know, for, for this nickel oxide system in, in particular, but also uh, I think uh, they're, they're um, erbium ferrite, I want to say. Uh, I could I could be uh, wrong about that and and calcium fluoride for for uh, some of the, the switching uh, Andrea uh, Cavallari and others have shown uh, some some very uh, nice uh, nice experiments that that um, allow you to essentially use this uh, uh, photomagnetic uh, coupling to engineer very various different non equilibrium phases or even uh, give interesting uh, types of, of phase transitions. So what we were trying to see here is if you can have synthetic fields that actually compete with some of the stuff that people are doing in, in the cold atom community. And, and turns out the answer to that is yes, uh, as long as you can do this experiment in, in serum trichloride. And I, and I looked, you can buy serum trichloride, I think on Sigma Aldrich. I don't know how people would feel about uh, a theorist buying some, some, you know, crystals or something, but um, yeah. Maybe you I'll can just send it to people. It somewhere. Uh, there we go. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I can, I can just, well, this is recorded. I can't even say it. I can neither confirm nor deny. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Hervoya looks like he has a question. Yes. Yes. Hervoya. Yeah. Uh, you wanted to talk about uh, hydrodynamics and vorticity. And uh, so I, I would like to know if you can imagine that one could uh, generate magnetic monopoles uh, uh, inside the uh, um, using electronic uh, hydrodynamic motion? Um, using electronic hydrodynamic motion, I'm not yet sure, oh. but we what we did think about is if you have a system with broken time reversal symmetry, right? Um, uh, you could essentially form steady state vortices in uh, these Corbino disk geometries. So essentially, you know, uh, you, you could think of it as like being on the inside or the outside of the track, you've essentially created a, a gradient and um, that would just give you straight up in, in some of these uh, uh, um, lower symmetry systems, uh, steady state vortices. Um, how that shows up in the magnetic properties, I have to think about that harder, but the way we were thinking of these being detected was using, you know, you have this Corbina disc and you have some magical uh, um, scanning and magnetometry that, that sits with it and you're essentially able to, to measure these uh, spatial signatures. Um, I'd love to think about how that manifests in some of the types of vortices that, that you're able to, to create. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions? So, uh, well, I, I have one question. So in the, uh, in the beginning uh, of your talk, you introduced this idea of uh, Photonic quasi particles, uh, which is really interesting. And uh, what I was wondering is whether the same or analogous types of phase based arguments that guarantee the you know stability of quasi particles for you know in Fermi liquid theory, whether they if there's a, a generalization or how it uh, how you can guarantee 
you know, the existence and uh, uh, of, of these quasi-particle states? Oh my gosh. Um, you know, um, I don't think we have any, any, so you're basically asking, is there a no-go theorem of some sort? Is that? Well, or is there something that, that, that guarantees that they, you know, would, would exist and be stable, uh, um, you know, under the arbitrary, it, you know, perturbation of, you know, for these, yeah, basically the, the, the photonic quasi-particles, I think it was somewhere in the beginning of the uh, talk. Yeah, I know. It's taking me forever to get back there, which is, okay, here we go. Um, so I think that as long as you can drive the system into a regime of strong coupling, these exist. Now, the question always is, can you take it to a regime of strong coupling? And loss, of course, turns things into to essentially broaden peaks. Uh, but also, if you can find, uh, I think, a, a good uh, set of, of excitations that would uh, couple selectively to the photon and not uh, immediately undergo some type of, of non-radiative uh, uh, decay. Um, people have tried this with various different excitations. I think it's, it's very... Uh, very possible that that you could get to regimes of, of even uh, ultra strong coupling using uh, some somewhat lossy uh, dielectrics. Probably metal plasmonics will be hard. Uh, I don't want to say undoable because people have looked at these uh, uh, tip on on surface with with single um, single. Uh, layer of, of material or, or molecule squished in between, uh, where you essentially go into a regime of strong coupling, not because you have high quality factor, but because you have very, very tiny mode value. So, um, so there, you know, you have two things you can change. Of course, having a quality factor, like what people have in optomechanics of, uh, of a million would be great, uh, but a mode volume that is, you know, on the, the order of a few uh, nanometer cube was also pretty good. So. So I think um, you could you could do this in, in various ways. It would be stable to probation for, for the amount of time that you don't have some radiative or non-radiative decay. Radiative decay in some of these cases, presumably if you're in strong coupling, shouldn't be an issue. I think it's the non-radiative decay that becomes a problem because the more you're squishing electromagnetic energy into a system, the more likely you are that it also excites other stuff. Right. Um, okay, so are, uh, are there other questions? Question. Yeah. Yeah, Professor. So my impression is that you say that uh, phonal interaction can enhance the electron hydrodynamics. But, but my interpretation is that uh, for electron hydrodynamics to work, so the electron momentum should be conserved. If yeah. There is oh, phonal... yes. Okay, somebody asked. So since somebody asked, we got to talk about this, Jeremy. I'm, I'm sorry. I've been <laughs> waiting for this question. <laughs> because this is uh, exactly what we calculate and, and we resolve this mystery of how you can have uh, uh, um, electron hydrodynamics. All right. So, yes, you need momentum to be conserved. But here's the thing. The, the electron-electron diagram that is Coulomb mediated is the one that people typically say is what gives you electron-electron interactions. It's not the only electron-electron diagram that exists. There's one that is mediated by virtual phonon this primarily shows up in, in BCS theory, but also in our view is implicated in hydrodynamics in these systems. And here's why. This diagram also equally conserves momentum and we show quite conclusively, not just for uh, tungsten diphosphide or, or some of the other systems, but also for tungsten telluride, that of all the types of, of uh, diagrams that would contribute, this is the one that actually sets the, the time scale in the regime of hydrodynamics. And I can pick, I can pick which diagram that I, I then end up using in my transport equation. Using this um, and now comparing with beautiful experiments that Uri Vol and Asaf Hamo in, in Amir Yacobi's group have done of scanning magnetometry, looking at the, uh, um, the and, and scanning magnetometry, looking at the spatial signatures. I, I didn't get a chance to mention this, but hydrodynamics is a, a phenomena that shows up in, in spatial signatures. It's, it doesn't make sense without a, a geometry or, or a let scale. This is where we see as a, as a function of temperature, there is a zone of peak hydrodynamics that co corresponds exactly to where this diagram dominates over others. And it's still momentum conserving. However, it's a, it's a phonon mediated electron electron diagram, not the Coulomb interaction that gives you that strong interaction. Um, I, can, I can talk about this. Uh, 
uh, pretty much endlessly. But we also find that if you look at the line widths, by the way, um, say, say, for example, in tuxedo phosphide, that's the paper that just appeared in, in PRX, um, you, you actually realize there's specific phonon modes that are responsible for being a part of that electron phonon diagram that, again, uh, don't have the, the same um, temperature dependent behavior as, as uh, the ones that have nothing to do with uh, hydrodynamics. So I think we have now by, by a series of very different genres of, of measurements and, and calculations shown that it's the phonon mediated diagram in, in vial semimetals that dominates. The question that many ask, and, and you didn't, but I'll, I'll ask it for you, is how much of it is related to topology? We don't know, but we do know uh, from, from uh, these temperature-dependent Raman measurements, the, the scanning magnet temperature-dependent scanning magnetometry, uh, the Sondheimer oscillation measurements from Philip Moll, and, and various other types of measurements that this is uh, the, the diagram that is contributing. So this actually does open up interesting questions like uh, for, for systems like tungsten telluride, where in, in a monolayer, uh, it of course is not a vile semi-metal, it alphabetically cannot be, but it is uh, at low temperatures, a, an unconventional, believed to be an unconventional superconductor. Uh, and in some other regimes with, with few layers is hydrodynamic. Is there a, a boundary between those two phases? How should I think about that? Or is it just a giant coincidence that this phonon mediated diagram shows up? So those are actually some of the questions that we are trying to address. And whoever asked me that question, uh, thank you very much for, for doing that. I promise I didn't that was, plant that question. Uh, that was you, Chi. So um, I think we should probably uh, end here and let's uh, everybody thank uh, Professor Narong again for a uh, public lecture. And uh, so uh, I, I want to uh, kick off everybody except the graduate students.